You know, to me, they have the better quality of wins. I mean, you know, they hung in with Iowa in one of the oddest scoring games I've ever seen. And then now they have a team who was ranked in the top five as a victory. I, I mean, to me, right now, they are the they are the uh, the number one team in the nation. I... Welcome to the official podcast of FCS Fans Nation with your hosts, Kyler Neal, Matthew Frazee, and Jamie Williams. FCS Fans Nation. We're going into root week five and it's time to rev it up. If you're watching on YouTube, you know exactly why I said that because it's Jamie and Matt like normal. We are missing our good friend Kyler tonight, but he is replaced by one of the best, one of our fellow family members on the FCS Fans Nation network, Dustin Helton, the Rev representing us from the wax sun podcast rev what is up my man thank you for stepping in real life sometimes impacts our normal hosting and we are so thankful to have you what's going on dude how's your monday oh no it's good uh, it's, uh you know Sting Skyler couldn't be on but at the same time i'll be glad to to fill his uh you know his shoes and i'll make sure that he gets uh, plenty of drinks this weekend at the battle of piney woods since he's going as my guest uh, to this yeah. to this shindig um no it's, it, everything's good thanks for having me on i really appreciate it yeah that's awesome you guys are gonna be getting together kyler uh, went to that prairie a and m game and he was man he's been kind of all over the place so it's awesome that you're gonna be at that awesome rivalry game for you guys jamie williams you get virtually no time to react to some things you might want to talk about because we have some quick hit questions on that topic so besides anything sunny going on in your life what else you got going on dude uh well i will not share the name that i gave to our friend the rev over here <laughs> but all you have to do is check his twitter bio but the one thing i do want to do uh honestly and sincerely is congratulate another one of our very very best one of our good friends mr chris hammond on his first day as an employee of the university of idaho you yeah. know his passion for the vandals and the sports program and they could not have found a better guy chris we are super excited for you heck yeah playing a little rock music for mr hammond congratulations there chris An official employee of uh, the vandals a team he loves the guy has some passion beyond belief for that squad and this is really a dream position for him so we couldn't be happier for mr hammond and he's still going to be a proud admin and uh, FCS Fans Nation contributor. So, gentlemen, breaking news beyond belief with people's lives and everything else and having the rev tonight. But why don't we get into all the crazy news we had from week four and react to some things for the possibility of week five. Let's kick things off like we normally do with the big seven. The top seven FCS topics of the week. This is the big seven. All right, gentlemen, great fan questions here. Rev, I'm really excited about having you on tonight because I've been on Twitter. I've been on Facebook. I've been seeing the interactions and back and forth as the top three, four teams in the polls are really starting to get some heavy debates. And I know you don't think like most folks in this arena. So Mr. Steve Kurtenbach is our first gentleman here to kick off the Big Seven with an awesome question uh, kind of going off the game of the week last week, which only the Bison fan was able to pick correctly with those bunnies coming out on top over Missouri State. And uh, Mr. Steve Kurtenbach wants to know, uh, were you surprised by the dominating performance of South Dakota State over Missouri State, considering all the injuries the bunnies have and the Bears' performance at Arkansas? I'm going to tag on Peter Haugen as well, who also had a question about, is Missouri State maybe a little bit overhyped? So, Rev... You are high on the bunnies, man. What was your reaction to that game? What are you thinking about the rabbits right now? Yeah, it wasn't a shock to me. Like I get people have been down on South Dakota State because their their offense has been a little sluggish as the as the year's been going on. But realize, you know, they lost their offensive coordinator. They lost Eck. He's in Idaho. 
it's a new it's a new offense they're running and you have to have you know just those, those learning curves their defense is what's carrying them their defense has looked great and the way that this game matched up against missouri state missouri state yes they have jason shelley who's who's great but if they if jason shelley gets injured and let's hope he doesn't they're not a top five team they're not a top 10 team at that point he's what's carrying this team their offensive line play is atrocious i believe um, before the game started, they had given up 17 sacks and they gave up four. So they're at 21 um, this year, which makes them one of the worst in the FCS in terms of offensive line production. Um, the South Dakota State defense basically can you look at the stats of this game. I mean, just how little um, Missouri State was able to move the ball. There's only a, a 185 yards passing. The South Dakota State got two picks. I mean, they completely honestly, the, the score was even closer to me than, than the game really was. This isn't a surprise. I rank South Dakota State number one in my poll because if you look at their body of work this year versus North Dakota State and versus Montana, to me, they have the better quality of wins. I mean, you know, they hung in with Iowa in one of the oddest scoring games I've ever seen. And then now they have a team who was ranked in the top five as a victory. I, I mean, to me, right now, they are the they are the uh, the number one team in the nation. I think the uh, the marker is going to be a true test for them just to see how deep they are, because I think they have, I think they have the most talented roster in FCS, but I think North Dakota state has a deeper roster. Um, just hopefully South Dakota state doesn't do what South Dakota state does and has a stumble where they give up a hail Mary or something the last minute and completely just throws their season out of whack. But as of right now, to me, they're the best in the FCS. Man, high praise for the Jackrabbits. Um, I, when everyone keeps talking, they do use the word dominant. They do, you know, it's very impressive that they won this game. Anytime you go on the road and have a top five victory in the stats top 25 poll, that is nothing to not knock down. So I don't want this to come across as like I'm knocking SDSU down at all. Uh, it's a very impressive win. Anybody else who would have done this, you, you know, you would have been chest pumping. You would have been all about it. Um, but it was a pretty close game going throughout. The thing that really shined through, in my opinion, was an established coaching staff and then a little bit more strength in the tre trenches and depth, you know, because 14 points by SDSU came in the fourth quarter. You know, we're talking a 14-14 game going into the fourth. And the, the most impressive thing with South Dakota State, of course, is that defense. But their offense is starting to figure it out. You know, when you lose an NFL prospect tight end, that's going to hurt a little bit. Mark Gronowski, there's still going to be a learning curve when you come off that ACL tear. So I think South Dakota State is starting to pick up a little bit momentum. This will certainly help. Um, I tweeted this out. It's going to be super interesting. They're, they're going to win their next two weeks. And NDSU is going to beat Indiana State and Youngstown the next two weeks. And you're going to have number one versus number two in the Dome. Full throat, sell out Fargo Dome. There won't be an empty seat. And will South Dakota State go up there and knock NDSU down? in a game where um, you haven't seen them go into a dome and beat NDSU since 2016 on a last second play. And yep, they got that victory, but like they could smell blood in the water when they played them in the spring. NDSU was so vulnerable in a quiet dome, right? And then 2021, you go to Brookings where they're very comfortable and they just whoop the crap out of a QB transitioning NDSU team. Can they go into an established NDSU, which is vulnerable a little bit more than we thought, but can they go up into the full throat Fargo Dome? I hate to go down the line because I'm not reacting to Missouri State, but um, I picked S the reason I'm going by it is because I picked SDSU to win and I thought they were going to beat Missouri State because I thought the offense and defensive lines of Missouri State would not hold up. So credit to the Jackrabbits, huge win. And I don't think your logic is so crazy there, Rev. Jamie, what do you think, man? What's your reaction to this? Is Rev crazy? Uh, do you think NDSU, Montana still deserve that praise? What do you think? Yeah, no, I'm I'm not going to take a lot of time on this because I think you both hit the points I was looking at. It definitely took a while for that offense to gel. Um, the big thing was they got Zach Hines, the, the other tight end, involved. It's seven catches for 127. So I, th I think they kind of went back to the identity of their, their offense. I did, Davis had 20 carries. So they, they were got back to what they do well, what they've always done well. And I think people look at that Iowa game and thought that they were just going to, you know, score some points and be able to put up, and then they didn't get anything done. But Iowa's a top 15 FBS defense. So, you know, they're no James Madison on defense, especially against the run. Oh, but, um, really? you know, Iowa's a good defense. <laughs> um, and also, I just want to thank Joshua Hoppin for the nice shirt that I'm rocking here today yeah. based off from off the big win. Uh, so, you know, just, yeah, I, I wasn't surprised. Um, I might have picked 
Missouri State, but that doesn't mean I was shocked when the Jackrabbits did what they did. Uh, the way they bottled up Jason Shelley as well. Um, uh, Jacks are back. Jacks are back, man. It's going to be we're ever gone. <laughs> it's going to be fun in a few weeks, but they're answering a few questions, which is great. Speaking of questions, guys, obviously these are all the questions you're getting are from the FCS Fans Nation Facebook and Twitter page. We post every Sunday to say, hey, give us questions. If you guys ask it, we're going to answer it. doesn't matter if you're asking about tailgate food or any team in the FCS. If you want us, you want your question answered, make sure you post under the official post. And um, the questions we may have might be about last week when we said the University of Incarnate Word is almost like a guaranteed top four seed because their schedule is so easy. And what do you know there, Jamie? Uh, <laughs> University of Incarnate Word goes down and loses a crazy ending game to Danny Johnson's team, the Lions. And I have to toss this one. I'm not just going to go to the Rev the first all night, but I mean, I have to start with the Rev here based off Incarnate Word, an SFA fan, obviously a little history from last year. Um, Rev, what do you think of when you, you saw that game for UIW and SLU? We I, I I saw him. I think I saw him frozen through that. Yeah, it looked like he was frozen. I'll just I'll just pick up where he uh, left off with that great analysis. He was starting. I, I could tell he was going to have something really profound to say. Um, but I think this is a really good question from Brandon because. But I also don't think it's one or the other because I don't know that we overhyped Incarnate Word. I think they got the amount of hype they deserve based off how they started the season. But at the same time, SLU's always played them tough. Southeast Louisiana did lose to them last year, but that's been a high powered offense and to have Cephas Johnson go out and working with a freshman quarterback and all of that. I just feel like, you know, it was just one of those games that happens and it was a great back and forth game, which you come to expect from a Southland type of team. And then both teams are very good. Um, SLU hadn't shown it early because they had started with a couple of, FBS teams that you thought maybe they would have been able to pick one off and they didn't look as good and then, you know, whipped Central Connecticut State, but they showed that they're still a team to be reckoned with and not going to go away. So I, I think that's part of what we just thought, you know, we saw what we had seen from Incarnate Word. We had seen SLU not be what they were, obviously, and you wouldn't expect them to coming off the loss of Cole Kelly, but they have a running game now too. Mm. So they did pick up... Um, I believe it's Carlos Washington from New Hampshire, if that's the guy I'm thinking of. I believe that's who is at SLU now, um, who was splitting time up there. So a little bit more balance to that offense. And then they, the safety fell down and they made a play and the game was over. So it's a good question, Brandon. Um, I enjoyed like thinking about that one a little bit. I, but I don't think we overhyped the word. I, I think we gave them what the hype they deserved. And SLU beat them on yeah, the field, fair and square. I think they really, yeah, the, the, they rose to where the hype existed because you and Kyler in no way had faith in them. I think it like the beginning of the year, and I don't do rankings, so I'm not saying you guys did anything wrong, but uh, I think really Sam Herter was really the only one who kind of went out on a ledge and said, hey, I think Incarnate Wars is going to be really good. Everybody else said, oh, that's a team who lost their star QB. He's up in the Pac-12 now. Like, there's no way they're going to be that good. So I think the hype at last week's point was deserved, especially when nobody thought that, I mean, who was picking besides Danny Johnson and the Lions crew, who was picking them to win, right? You can't tell me that anybody was out there in FCS fans nation land going, Oh yeah, this is the one they, they trip up. We did say last week, if they lose, it's going to happen here, but we did not believe it would occur. Um, so I think incarnate Word still is likely to win the rest of their games, but maybe I'll have my foot in my mouth again. Rev, we got you back on a few technical difficulties. What was your reaction to those, this whole thing, man? Yeah, to Brandon's question, I don't think UIW was overhyped. I think they were hyped based upon how they performed. You know, you look at their performance the first few weeks, look at the games they won. I mean, they deserved the ranking that they got. Um, SLU, I think maybe folks were doubting them a little bit because they were they were assuming it was just the Cole Kelly show and that's it. And they showed that it that it's not, that they put together um, a, a pretty decent team. Um, down there and plus you know those two schools they know each other real well they i mean and the southland is a tour two horse race it's uiw and slu and there's nobody else in that conference that's going to compete this year so it would not surprise me to see uiw run the rest of the way through the schedule go undefeated 
the only way I could see them like slipping up is just if they do something to themselves or they have a, a serious entry to the doctor, Lindsey Scott Jr. Like those are the only two things I could potentially see them because I mean, they're going to beat, you know, Houston Christian. They're going to beat McNeese. They're going to beat Northwestern state. These teams are all just bad. Nichols is bad this year too. So, you know, I think you'll see Incarnate Word still in the playoffs as an at-large, even if, uh, you know, if uh, let's assume SLU wins the rest of the way, Carter Word wins the rest of the way, SLU is going to get the, the auto bid. Incarnate Word will definitely get an at-large. And I think you could still see Incarnate Word, they have the talent and the depth to just to to actually make it still a decent run in the playoffs. So this game isn't, to me, a major setback to them. It's just the difference from them playing Thanksgiving weekend versus playing potentially having the weekend off. Yeah, just yeah real I quick think for uh, Dustin mentioned um, Dr. Lindsey Scott, I think you could just t- see actually his talent by looking at how bad the Nichols offense is this year. Yeah. He made Colin Guggenheim go last year and Guggenheim gone nowhere this year. Um, so, yeah, I think we underappreciated uh, the good doctor. <laughs> the good doctor uh that man we, we yep we do not plug that show in any way <laughs> <laughs> oh man um yeah i think incarnate word i love your final thought there dustin where it's like this just might be the difference between they can still pull a seed but this is definitely probably out of top four seed territory at a minimum which uh definitely can have some impacts we know how big home field advantage could be in the playoffs so all right guys evan wilson longtime listener great fan he wants to know who is the best two loss team in the country right now. And I've got a few options for you guys. If you have some outliers, um, definitely throw them at me, but I got a few options as I'm going to roll through here a little bit. Um, first off, when you look in the big sky, I hate to say it and maybe we're biased cause we, we love Kyler, but I think you have to put Eastern Washington on there. So they're, they are a one and two team right now. Uh, people were really high on Campbell. They're out sitting at one and two as they're about to begin conference play. Um, when you look at Rhode Island, there could be a possibility. That's a team that was obviously preseason had some hype. I don't know if you guys have fallen off on them. Moving to the Missouri Valley, Valley, you have to look at hot and cold Southern Illinois. Um, UND, if you're hot on them, you could throw them up as options. Of course, Missouri State as well, now sitting with the two losses. And then we roll a little bit into a playoff team last year of Tennessee Martin with two losses. And I'll give you one final one here out of the Southland. We literally just talked about them, Southeastern Louisiana. So quite a few options there. That's a lot to kind of digest. But Jamie, anything there pop off the charts for you? Or do you have an outlier that I didn't mention? You know, there's there's a couple. Um, one of them that you mentioned I, I'll, is the one I'll bring up. I'm going to leave one on the board that I think the Rev might hit on just from the the lens that he watched the uh fcs world through so i'm gonna go say and say missouri state because their two losses are to a top ranked fbs team in arkansas a game that they controlled for almost three quarters and then a loss to our number two team south dakota state so you know you can't really fault them for either of those losses and they're still right in the thick of everything uh, and i think you've mentioned some really really good teams some really solid options but who the best two loss team right now? I think it is uh, Missouri State. Uh, did I leave one on the board for you, Rev? Well, mine. I mean, obviously, you could easily talk about Southeastern Louisiana, especially with their their performance last week. But mine's not on the board. Mine is the Idaho Vandals, and the reason why Vandals. I, yeah, mine's the Idaho Vandals. And granted, I still. And here's the thing: I it was kind of hit or miss on ranking them in top twenty five. But let's if you look at their their year. I mean, they started off the year with two FBS losses. And I mean, they were in both those games. They hung in against, um, you know, they they hung in on both the games, and they then now they've gotten wins the past two weeks. Eck has gone in there and completely caused a change there in the half of a beer can that they play in. Um, you know, they and their defense is looking really good. I, I, you know, I don't think they're in the contention for the Big Sky um title this year i still think it's too early but i i think that they're a bit undervalued at the moment um you know uh when folks are looking at their polls so to me um i mean if you want to choose an outlier to me it's um idaho idaho yeah there you go man chris hammond's gonna love this episode when he listens (laughs) to it um i think i just have to stick with southeastern louisiana guys because again i'm gonna be high on i'm not gonna say it's kind of a bad cop out to be like, I think they're going to win a lot of games because their competition sucks. But 
you know, if they are the type of team that can continue to win, you're, you're going to play Murray State at home, the new Texas A&M Commerce. McNeese, Lamar, Northeastern State, Nichols. I guess going to Nichols could be tough for them, as could Jacksonville State, obviously. Uh, but, you know, if they could just maybe only lose one more, could they be possibly a bubble team the way things are already falling this year? You know, you thought there could be like six Valley teams in the playoffs and all these other teams. Big Sky obviously looks pretty strong. But if they could sneak into the playoffs and they could play some auto bid, weaker conference, they could end up in at least round two of the playoffs. And I'd say that'd be a pretty good season after losing Cole Kelly and others. So I think there's a lot of skin left on the, uh, or there's a lot of meat left on the bone for these guys. So I think Southeastern Louis has a good shot. Am I overreacting to that or, or what do you think? No. no, when you look at their schedule, when you look at the Southland, it's, it's pretty weak. The one game I could see them potentially tripping up on is Nichols. And it's not because Nichols is good. It's that that's the river bell and weird stuff happens. Riverbell game, you know, it seems like years when you thought Nichols was going to be the favorite Southeastern Louisiana gets to win and vice versa. So that would be uh, looking at the rest of their schedule. That would be the only game that's concerning to me just because weird stuff happens during that game. Other than that, the it's, it's their conference to roll through because the rest of the, the rest of the conference is just not good this year. Yeah. It's, the FCS has a really cool setup right now where it's like everybody wants to debate those top three, four teams they believe are the only title contenders. But then you even go to two lost teams and you've got a lot of options of teams who could be really good and make some things happen, which is super, super exciting. Um, those two lost teams obviously have some things missing. So we might want to know what are these top five teams missing? Dustin Perman with a excellent question for us here tonight. Uh, he asks a combination of offense and defense is a winning combination in the top five. Are the teams balanced with stronger defense, stronger offensive teams? What's your favorite recipe uh, or missing one ingredient? What's your missing ingredient that everybody else uses uh, amongst these top five teams? So, Dustin, I want to take your question this way. When you guys think of these top five teams, you think you're North Dakota State, you think you're South Dakota State, you're Montana's, uh, whoever you guys want to recycle into that number five slot, go ahead. What is like your missing recipe and piece that you are seeing right now? Um, I'll speak on the bison a little bit just to make this easy right there. The Bison are slowly developing what we, in my opinion, what was always going to be issues this year. An established wide receiver and passing game because Christian Watson gone is a huge loss. And the front seven's really young. Yeah, they returned a lot this year, but the linebackers and their defensive line was completely restarted. They got Spencer Wagey back, who's a freak defensive end because of an injury a red shirt, but they have to develop a stronger front seven as the season grows and be more shirt up on tackles. NDSU has had some weird discipline issues this year, but they'll get that figured out. And then they have to develop the passing game better. So I'd really say NDSU has got on two fronts on both sides of the ball, things they need to square away. Um, but time can heal those for them. Uh, Jamie, what do you think about the other Dakota there when you look at South Dakota State? Do they kind of have it figured out right now? Yeah, well, I've kind of looked at the top five, and I, I kind of pinpointed one thing for each one of them. But I'll go to uh, South Dakota State. Um and I just think it's just the balancing the injuries that they've lost. That's that's their missing uh, ingredient there. They've had a lot of injuries to overcome, and Gronowski coming back off of the, the injury in the spring. And I just think that it's going to take some time. And you can see it's taken time. And this past week, it all seemed to click. So is it something that's going to start clicking consistently, or do they still need a couple more weeks to – really get everything going and refine their identity, find their new offensive identity. Uh, like Dustin said earlier, X gone. Um, so I, I think that's their, their missing piece um, for uh, them, for, for the Bison, since you already addressed them. I think it's just the execution that the Bison have always had. They don't make mistakes late in games, and they have this year. Uh, look at the Arizona game, and I know we're talking about an FBS game, but I, I think you can see it permeating across – all of the games that where they would generally not make certain mistakes, silly or otherwise, even discipline mistakes that yeah, they're no making doubt. them. And that's one thing I've seen. For sure. Absolutely. <laughs> Is there anybody here at this point who's like the Grizz have an issue? Like, is I mean, you could point to strength of schedule, but that's not their fault. I mean, is there anything that you're looking at with the Grizz where you're like, oh, man, like maybe this might be a problem? I don't think people realize the transfers the Grizz brought in this year, too. Like they made some tweak good transfers all the way through the months building up, all the way up to the beginning of the season. 
to really bolster some of their lines in other areas. I mean, I think the Grizz have really a lot of things figured out. I think Montana State's on the – I think they're really going to struggle with the injuries and problems they have. Huge win for them, very resilient. But and Montana State fans are going to murder me if they make it to Frisco, dude, because I've just been all over them. Rev, do you see any problems with the Grizz, these top five teams? Where are you seeing vulnerabilities, man? You're, you're ranking the Rabbits first, so what do you what do you see? I just ranking the Rabbits because I think they're the most balanced – team out of uh out of um uh, out of all of them, especially as they get their offense going at the last two weeks the thing with montana to me is that you know they brought in a lot and i don't doubt their ability to win and how good they are but there you did say their strength of schedule and it isn't necessarily their fault but also has it been a true litmus test of how good of a team uh, how good they are when you look at who they played probably when they played south dakota that might have been a better a better sort of piece to see how how good they are to me the one to me the one thing that teams i i think falls by the wayside and it's the difference between being a a team in frisco or not is special teams play you have to have a good special teams play where you don't make stupid mistakes um either either just dumb penalties or or you know missing field goals and things like that you need and you, you know you need to have the ability to flip the field if you need to you need to have the ability to um, and to get in a good starting uh, starting position or even on the positive side of the field on, on return. So to me, that's when you, we asked about the recipe, you know, special teams to me is that last, is that intangible, that little X factor that does make the difference between between a playoff team and a team that's playing in Frisco in January. Yeah, absolutely. And I know NDSU and South Dakota State both have kicking issues. Both their kickers have not been great. So, you know, who's going to be the most well-rounded, well-balanced is really going to determine a lot of things. So Great question, Dustin. Yeah, I would say uh, Montana has the least amount of questions right now, but we'll, we're about to see their big sky test and how that compares to other things. So sometimes the eye test doesn't lie. Uh, speaking of eye tests, you know what? This this is interesting. It's the big seven. It's the big seven questions. But Noah Brandemil, um, and I probably butchered your last name. No, I tend to do that. You ask like three questions in one question, and I liked them all. So they're all going in. <laughs> And all three of the people here tonight are going to answer one part of it. Um, your whole question is, where does Elon sit in the CEA picture? Are they better than Jamie predicted with McKay at QB? Um, is MSU better off with one QB? We're not doing the Montana State part of this question. Okay, Noah, so I threw out one part. We're going to talk about Elon. Um, we're going to talk, are the Bison more vulnerable than we thought? And then a big shout-out. We're going to do a shout-out to that giant 103-yard return by Mr. Robbie Houck. So... Jamie, start with you, man. Is Elon, where do they sit in the CAA? They better or worse than you thought. What are, is your opinion on the Phoenix? They're definitely better than I thought because I had them 8th, ninth, 10th in the conference at best, and they're probably going to be 4th or 5th. Um, I, McKay has been better than I thought, um, and I did rank them this week, and I know they, they beat William & Mary. But I think if you replay that fourth quarter ten more times, William and Mary still wins another nine of them. I I don't understand honestly why they how they blew that game because William and Mary is usually one of those teams this year that could really grind down the end of a game and they just didn't. And Elon made the plays, so I'm not taking anything away from them. So they made the plays and McKay led the team down you know the way he needed to and and got you know got the scores. Uh, defense uh, caused a fumble. Uh, which kind of turned some of the momentum there after they had, had closed in the first uh, touchdown. And uh, just William Mary was unable to recover from that. But, I mean, the run game is, is what has always been the hallmark of Elon's game, and they ran for 240 yards this week and four touchdowns. Jeez. So, yeah, I mean, and McKay was a part of that. He ran for 85 himself. So I, I think just the Elon identity is is still to run the ball, but I think McKay has done a better job than I expected. So. Just chalk that up on another one I was wrong about this year. I mean, I was right about Villanova. Um, but, yeah, Elon, I was definitely uh, wrong on. And uh, we'll see. Uh, they got some tests coming up. Um, Richmond, Rhodey, New Hampshire. I mean, that those those aren't chump teams. Um, so No, they're going to – that's a whole different beast of a schedule when you have Delaware, uh, Richmond, Rhode Island, New Hampshire. Yeah, that is not going to be easy. So you might be right at the end of the day, Jamie. They look good now, but – We'll have to see. Um, speaking of looking good and bad, is NDSU vulnerable? Okay, Noah, here's how I'm going to put this. Um, NDSU is not the team we all thought they were in the preseason. 
Everybody thought this was NDSU's year. Undoubtedly, no debate at all. And everybody else was playing for second. There's only two other times where everybody really felt that about NDSU, like truly. 2013 and 2018. Brock Jensen senior year and um, the senior year of Easton Stick. I mean, it was just no question. Both teams went undefeated. They were so good. But NDSU is vulnerable. Yes, they're more vulnerable now to... They're more vulnerable to four or five teams, maybe instead of two or three, if that makes sense, just because they are growing still in some areas and they've had some injuries. Uh, losing Tutsi and at their defensive tackle position was huge. He's an All-American, and Noah Gindorf, tight end, might be out for the year. They're unsure on that. Those are big hits. And so NDSU has not looked as disciplined as they had in the past. The thing with the Bison, though, is everything is fixable. Like The passing game can continue to grow throughout the season. And the front seven is going to continue to grow up in front of our eyes. So right now, NDSU looks more vulnerable to the top five, six teams instead of just the top two or three. But it's all where you want to bet your money on. If you're an FCS fan, and you're like, can the Bison be taken down? Can we take them down at least before Frisco? You need them to lose to SDSU because I don't think they're going to lose to anybody else. I don't think anybody else is going to grind them out over fourth quarters. So if you're a Bobcat fan, a Grizz fan, somebody who thinks you could host NDSU in the playoffs in the semifinals, um, cheer like heck for the Bunnies. So, And then Rev, why don't you just, um, did you happen to catch that play on that kickoff return touchdown by the Grizz? I saw a video of it on Twitter uh, yeah, just, just in passing, yeah. <laughs> absolute insanity. Um, one, why don't you just give one more shout out to that play and uh, – just a, a reiteration of your special teams. Jamie goes, no way. We're not going to talk about the group. I mean, I mean, I mean, it's if you haven't seen it, I mean, there, there's a video of it from the freaking mountaintop, which is insane to see too. That uh, so has been cool. going around. It's so cool. But no, shout out. What a what a heck of a return. I think it was 106 yards, if I remember correctly. No, it's 99 heard. because he botched it because he didn't catch it clean and it went out. <laughs> Hey, we got to give the Grizz more love. Okay, first off, it's the Grizz fans' fault. You, they should be asking us more questions. Grizz fans, you should be asking us more questions. We've talked about you more. You guys are looking like a Frisco team, so dang, get on Facebook and ask us some more questions. Um, but we do have the Fight on Montana podcast on the FCS Fans Nation Network, so I'm sure on YouTube, uh, which you guys should all be subscribing to right now if you have the YouTube app on your phone, FCS Fans Nation Network, there is the Fight on Montana podcast as part of it. And I'm sure that's where all the Grizz fans are flocking to. And we hope you guys are. They run a really good pod, really good show. But shout out to the Grizz. They're doing big things. Your real challenges are going to start now in the big sky. Look forward to seeing how you do it. So, Jamie, uh, two more questions here in our big seven. This one mostly going to let you run with here. Um, I'm a big proponent of this, and I was messaging you, Jamie. Uh, Cody Cathams wants to ask, what are the odds a fullback actually wins the Walter Payton Award? This seems like a QB-heavy trophy. The reason I was messaging was because if I said if Walter Payton voters could watch Hunter Lipke actually just run dudes over, over and over and over again beyond the line of scrimmage, beyond past that first point of contact, plus his touchdowns, oh, dude could win the Walter Payton. He's not going to get enough touches because he's not a one-man show, but what do you think, Jamie? We'll put it this way. Could he be in the top three? Could he make it to the top three voting point? Do you think that? Well, I mean, it's not a how many people did you truck award either. So it should be. Well, I understand. You know, you North Dakotans, you'll need something. Jamie, 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 to be fair, Hunter, like NDSU's last Walter Payton Award winner, has thrown zero interceptions this season. So you true. better consider it. That is true. I didn't vote for that one either. But honestly, the funny thing is, this question came out. And Sam Herter put out a, a beautiful article today on just this subject. So I would encourage people to go read our friend Sam Herter's article about this. I'm not sure I agree with Sam. His logic is very sound, but I, I don't think Lipke wins. Uh, could he be one of the invited ones? Maybe, but it's it's a quarterback award. It's a flash award. And, and I know Hunter has some flash of the way he hits. And when he does become the focal point of that offense, it, it's pretty dominant, but he's not the focal point of the offense all the time. And that's really what you get from a Walter Payton Award winner, somebody who carries their individual team all the way with the big stats. It, it, it's a war on numbers mostly. Um, yeah, so. if, Zach, if Zach Zenner didn't win at SDSU, 
with all his rushing yards back in the day. Kind of would be hard for Lunter too, but man, you almost wish he'd get a little more respect in the name. But at the same time, he's getting plenty of respect. Everybody knows him. He's going to go to the Senior Bowl. Rev, uh, is it a QB award, man? What do you think? It is, and it's a QB award that, honestly, in my opinion, that for the most part benefits QBs that play against weaker competition and are able to pad their stats. It should, I mean, it should be a metric of who's the actual best all-around player, and I think you would have to look at Luke for that. But, I mean, if you look at past winners, I mean, Jeremiah Briscoe won it twice, you know, decimating a Southland Conference that couldn't play defense. Jeremy Moses won it for SFA, decimating a Southland Conference that couldn't play defense. I mean, one of the few exceptions is probably, you know, when, when you know, Cup – and uh, took it as a wide receiver but no it is it, it's become a flash award in my opinion it's still a great award i just almost wonder if you're going to have a flash award if you should have you know another another one um i don't know how you do best all around offensive player but i, I don't know how you would do it because i mean luke he would get that for the way he plays but no i i don't i don't think he'll have the stats to even be invited he might appear on a watch list but i don't think it goes any further than that and, and it's a shame to be honest with you because he's probably one of the best players in FCS. Yeah, and to, to defend the stats award a little bit is, I think they've, uh, some people have said this quite a bit, you know, it is literally in the name, stats award, you know. Uh, it's not most valuable player, and um, I'm going to defend it a little bit. I wish it was. I wish your Chris Strevlers of the world would have won it over Briscoe's and other scenarios, but um, you got to kind of redefine the term. So end of the day, it is what it is. Hunter's great, and uh, it'll be interesting to see who wins that Walter Payton Award. Final Big 7 question from one Dustin Helton, the Rev. Yes, always dropping questions for us, and now he is here in person. Holy moly. Okay, Dustin, so uh, I, I was curious on this question. I put it in the Big 7 because you just simply asked, what has been your favorite September surprise? So I was thinking, hmm, are we getting – is this personal or is this <laughs> – Football. I didn't know. So if Kyler would have been here, I would have made us all answer both ways. A September surprise that was personal and a September surprise that was football related. Um, so um, I guess I can start off with mine. I am very, very, very surprised that the big sky looks as good as it does. That is my September surprise for FCS football. Um, I'm not shocked that what I consider a big three conference or maybe big two now is doing well, but I didn't expect Sac State to look as good as they did. I didn't expect Montana State to look. I know that they were top four, but I was not high on them. I knew the Grizz were going to be good. They looked dang good. It just all the way to the Idaho Vandals are looking good. I think the big sky across the board is looking so, so strong. And then uh, my new family member, Watson, uh, We our car... <laughs> My Tesla arrived, my wife and I's Tesla, which we ordered months ago, showed up in September. I thought it would show up in October. So our little red Watson has been EVing it around North Dakota, and that has been a ton of fun. So that's my little personal surprise. Jamie, a personal and a FCS football surprise for September from the Rev. What do you got? Uh, well, I'm going to sit here and talk about the football one because I don't really know of anything else. Um, oh, and I'll, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll try to come up with you something. <laughs> I, I can't talk about it because you said it's not foot. I can't do oh, football and football. Yeah, and then that's true. Oh, shoot. Um, but I, I want to. I'm going to try to go outside because I listened to um, Dustin and the team this, this afternoon, and I'm going to try to mention something they didn't. Because when I first had the question, I was looking at Mercer, but Mr. McCreary took that one. But I, I'm going to stay in the SoCon and say Sanford being for real. I, I just didn't see it. I see them as a team that just gets obliterated on the back set on the back four on the secondary and just can't hang and plays a lot of shootouts. And they handled a team in Western Carolina that came into the game throwing for almost 400 yards a game and scored 40 some points. So I think Sanford is actually for real and is going to challenge for that soak on title. Another spot where I guess what was dead wrong. Um, uh, personal yeah i mean i mean it's been a good september uh, but nothing you know shocking going on you know things are going well gardens going well you know the dolphins are three and oh it's you know <laughs> shocking <your> stuff mouth. <laughs> jamie's hey, gonna you know smash what? smash his computer in if front. they want to be excited about a two-point win over a team <laughs> playing eight backups <laughs> god bless them <laughs> Oh, uh, we have no re mo uh, reason to talk smack. Rev and I are both sad, pathetic Cowboy fans, so we just have nothing to 
live for right now. Rev, uh, just a quick September surprise for you, man. Football and personal, what do you have there? It's yeah. your question. Have the so when I, wrote, when I asked the question, I meant fully football. but Because then I realized that also, too, that whenever I brought it up, it, it set me up to get shredded about SFA. Um, but to <laughs> me, not necessarily surprised. And we did this did kind of get touched on, on on the Wax Sun Weekly podcast. But um, one of the biggest surprises to me is, is – and I'm going to tie it into Kennesaw State, but the inability for triple option teams, or teams you run it to move this year, I didn't think the new rule was going to be so impactful on those teams uh, with the service academies in the Citadel and um, you know and KSU. I, my, I figured that with that rule, they would find a way to adapt to open up their their you know their offense better, um, and it, I haven't seen it. And I, what I'm interested too is to see how they manage to come back and find a way to move the ball, whether they, you know, utilize a fullback to try to cheat the defense in or what, or what they decide to do. But um, that's been my surprise is just the inability of the triple option teams to actually move because of a rule change that, that that's shocked me. Um, personal one. I don't like um, we haven't had a hurricane this September in Texas. So that's, yeah, I guess, man. I guess that's been, a, <laughs> that's been a, a personal uh, a good thing because last year my my uh we got hit by one and it completely obliterated um my my fence and my but thankfully this year it's been nice and quiet so i'll take that as a as a as a win yeah, just absolutely isaac storm book too so yeah. <laughs> yeah september is is the worst storms that ever hit the town i live in um and uh, the two worst ones were all in september so well glad to hear everyone's safe glad to hear mother nature has been kind to you guys this year um and it has so far been a pretty kind FCS football season for everyone. Been pretty great. What might not be kind, though, is when people have to pay up for taco bets. It's time to put your money where your mouth is. And if you're right, put some tacos in there, too. This is Thompson's Taco Bets. All right, gents, prepare for the next taco bet. And as you know, our taco bets only come from fan questions. John Arid is our individual who has set us up here. He says, what is the ceiling for Idaho? He thinks if they clean up penalties, they'll finish in the top half of the big sky. They have to beat UNC, PSU, UC Davis, and upset Eastern Washington, Sac State, or Montana to make the playoffs. He thinks seven is the ceiling. So here you go. Taco bet. Here we go. The Idaho Vandals over under six and a half wins total for the rest of the season. I am pulling up their schedule as we speak. If you guys are watching on YouTube, which you should be, make sure you subscribe. Shameless plug. There you go. All right. Over under guys. Chris Hammond just getting his job. This timed out really well, John. So thank you for the question. Okay. Tacos are on the line. Jamie, you look at that schedule. What do you think? Over under six and a half wins. They are two and two right now, and they have seven games remaining. What do you think? Well, let's break down the schedule a little bit. Let's say they're going to get wins over Northern Colorado, Portland State, and Idaho State. So that's five, which means they have to beat two of the big boys. And that thing is, do I have confidence that they beat two of the big boys? I think they can beat Eastern at home because they do because you know the scoreboard plays defense. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a matter: of, can they beat Sac State, Montana, or UC Davis? Yeah, that's the tough call, dude. I, I say no way they go to Washington Grizz and win. Sac State looks like a very complete team, so it's going to come down to the result of the UC Davis game at They're home. At home. <laughs> I'm going to sadly take the under. Taking the under. Oh, Chris. That's okay. Six wins still. Good improvement. Dustin, what do you think? You get Tacos on the line. We're going to be eating them in Frisco, buddy. No, I got to agree with Jamie, and he covered the same thing. It, I, I, you got to take the under here. It's just their schedule doesn't play out. Like You would want to have Montana in the Kibbe Dome, and you'd want to have Sac State in the Kibbe Dome to, get, to, to realistically have a shot of winning those games. Um, yeah, I think they can beat Eastern. Because, like Jamie said, the scoreboard plays defense, and I think they could potentially, they might be able to potentially beat UC Davis. But I, I don't know. UC Davis has looked 
has looked pretty good. So, I, I mean, I, I got to take the under this year. I hope they prove me wrong. I'll be glad to buy tacos and losing this. But I, yep, think, okay. I think, yeah, I, I, don't get me wrong. I, this would be one of the best that if I lost, I'd be very happy I lost. So, but I got to, you know, I got to follow my my mind on this one. And it's, uh, it's to take the under. Ye of little faith. This podcast is boring if we all say under, which I will never do. Safe money don't make money. Over. Idaho. Upsetting UC Davis. No problem. Beating Eastern Washington. They're taking Idaho. Um, or they're taking Northern Colorado. They're taking Idaho State. They're taking Portland State. Rack it up. Seven wins. Idaho Vandals are going to pull it off. And um, I'll enjoy those tacos, gents. Man, either way, <laughs> it'll be fun. Uh, so Taco Bet this week ends with the Idaho Vandals over under for the season. That means, guys, we can roll into some of the rest of the questions we have with a few quick hits. Just because your question is answered quickly doesn't mean we don't care. These are the quick hit questions of the week. All right, gentlemen, time to get into some quick hit questions. And like I've said on the podcast before, if you ask it, we are going to answer it. So we're going to start with Dustin Helton, the Revs, other co-host of the Wax On podcast, which, of course, you should be subscribed to on any audio platforms in the FCS Fans Nation podcast network. Mr. Will Siller, of course, wants to know, what is your go-to gas station travel snack? And your go-to gas station travel drink. So when you stop at the gas station, uh, what are you grabbing for a quick snack and a quick drink? I am a Sour Patch Kid, sour gummy worm type of individual. If it's a long drive, it's a Red Bull. Otherwise, I'm probably going with a standard Mountain Dew or Cherry Coke. Basically, my stomach turns into a 12-year-old's dream and a 33-year-old's nightmare about an hour after I buy something from the gas station. <laughs> Jamie, do you go a little healthier there? Or uh, I, I'm guessing you go with a little bit more manly stuff than the sweets and sours. You would think, but no, I'm going to grab probably a pack of M&Ms and a Mountain Dew because if I'm stopping at the gas station, I'm probably heading home from the game and it's probably 9, 10 o'clock and I need to stay awake. So got to get the Mountain Dew, got to get some M&Ms. Um, and the over under on how long it'll take Matthew Frazee to say Will's last name correct is <laughs> November 15th. It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. Never gonna happen. <laughs> He's going to see him in Frisco and be like, Mr. Siller, how are you Will, doing? C.W. Siller, how are you, sir? Happens C. every C. year. <laughs> Will, your last name is now Siller. That's how, that is how it's pronounced. Oh, oh man. man. It, that is, it's the easiest weakness to bring up that makes everybody laugh when I interview. What's your weakness? I won't remember anybody's names ever. <laughs> uh, Rev, what are you grabbing at the gas station, dude? Man, whenever I'm rolling to Central Texas to go out to the river, I'll usually stop at Bucky's, which I don't know if you two have been able to experience oh, a Bucky's. My in your brother trip. talks in, about Bucky's all the in time. In your trip to Texas, but go in there, get some chocolate covered peanuts, and usually like a Gatorade or a Gatorade Zero. Um, not a big soda guy, surprisingly for all the other junk I drink. I'm not a, not a, not a big, big, uh, uh soda person. So that's usually the route I'll go is a bottle of water, Gatorade and a, and some chocolate covered peanuts. Best way to go. Man, Bucky's, my brother Ryan says Bucky's is not a gas station. It's an experience. Is that's exactly correct. <laughs> Very is cool. It? Well, there you go. Will, uh, if I ever pronounce your name, right, you can uh, reward me with some sour patch kids. Uh, guys, Bruce Edmiston, a amazing Jacksonville State fan, a great fan of the page. He wants to know how good would the OVC be today if Austin P, Eastern Kentucky, and Jack State had not jumped ship? Great question, Rev. What do you think, man? How good would that OVC conference be looking? Top four, top five? I think probably top top four. Honestly, that's I mean, you know, uh, Austin P and EKU have both looked great this year, and that was one interesting game last Saturday with uh, Austin P basically coming back and, and beating EKU at home. Um, Jacksonville State, I don't have my nobody cares sign that I had from the podcast yesterday, but you know, they didn't, you know, they didn't jump. I kind of wonder too if they weren't jumping if they would have Rich Rod, to be honest with you. I do kind of wonder that if Rich Rod would have been an FCS coach or not at that point. Um, and if if and if not, would Jacksonville State be as good as they are this year? And the answer is I, I mean I don't I don't know. Um, but yeah, I think they'd be a top, probably top four conference. It's, it's, I mean, if you look at how Southeast Missouri is playing this year, you look at DT Martin, um, you know, bringing in Lindenwood, um, you know, they're, they're building a, 
they were they would be building a good conference, but that conference still looks like it's a little shaky um, now, given the current situation. Yeah, uh, definitely would have been massively improved if you still had those teams around. Uh, speaking of improving or not improving or improving or not improving, Steve Kurtenbach wants to know, Jamie Williams, um, can the Jekyll and Hyde Southern Illinois Salukis continue their recent run of impressive wins and make the playoffs? Brutal, brutal schedule coming up. I'm going to try to pull it on the screen for you. What do you think? Do they have a chance? I think they have a chance, but you know they definitely dug themselves one heck of a hole. But at the same time, their two losses – are also good losses right now because they're both to ranked teams. Both teams are currently ranked Southeast Missouri and um, Incarnate Word. They had a big FBS win, so that's a check mark for them. And then they beat North Dakota. So they got Illinois State this week. That should be a win. Then it's tough. They got Missouri State. They've got South Dakota on the road. They get Northern Iowa and North Dakota State at home. And then Youngstown State is a team a lot of people like. So they could definitely rack up enough wins to put themselves in the discussion at the very least. So I, I think that they don't have much room for error. Maybe one more loss, two, depending on who it's to. But I, I think, yeah, I, I think they're going to be a bubble team and then we'll see what everybody else looks like. The yeah. sock Lukey fears nobody. The sock Lukey fears no one. One of the best memes I've ever seen. We'll have to see how SIU uh, keeps performing. We'll see how it goes for him. All right, guys. Is Valparaiso a pioneer contender? Here you go. Uh, Jacob Martinez says, how about a team I didn't think has ever been discussed in a positive light on this podcast? Pun intended. The Beacons. Um, is Valparaiso a pioneer contender after handling San Diego and playing competitively at Illinois State? Jacob Martinez, you rock because you run the Pick'em Challenge on our page, which is amazing. And um, let me just say this. Valparaiso lost by seven to Illinois State. And they got blasted by Dartmouth, but Dartmouth's a good team. And then they beat San Diego. If you beat San Diego, I know they weren't great last year, but if you beat San Diego, how could you not have a shot in the Pioneer League, especially based off all the past? Now, the question with Valparaiso is um, they play St. Thomas at home, which is a huge hookup. They play Butler at home, who hasn't been terrible. They're going to play Drake at home. I know these everyone listening is like, what the heck? What about these teams? But it's Pioneer League standard, right? Pioneer non-scholarship league standard. So I think Valparaiso has a shot to be at least a competitive contender. I'm not saying they're going to win it, but I think they actually do have a shot. So um, Jamie, would uh, we kind of talked about Davidson, San Diego. Uh, real quick from you, what do you think? They, they avoid Davidson, so they could at least yeah, that's force huge. a tie. I mean, they've already beaten San Diego, so yeah, I mean – they're definitely a pioneer contender. And like you said, think about it in the realm of the pioneer league, they're going to get their one bid. And right now Valpo is in a pretty decent spot if they can uh, pick up some wins. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It'll be fun to see what the beacons pull off. And I think that's a super sick and cool mascot and uh, logo as well. Uh, What do you think Rev Kyler's not here? So rep him a little bit tonight. Is Eastern Washington the best, um, Tim Rask asked this question, and then he put one or six or two and five team. Could they be one and six or two and five? Um, is Eastern like the worst, best team in recent memory? I kind of think of Weber State in That's, a few past seasons. I'm sorry to steal that from you, but what do you think? It's, uh, you know, Kyler might not appreciate this or he might, but honestly, I think it's last year's Weber State team. That yeah. would be the best bad team in recent memory. And I think they're showing that this year with how they're going through and just wrecking shop when they're playing. I mean, Eastern Washington has a brutal schedule this year, and they may or may not have a game this weekend, depending upon what happens with that storm. And that, I mean, if they don't have a game, that might be a blessing in disguise, to be honest with you. Um, you, you know, because you're not, they're not going to lose anything by not having a game besides maybe, maybe some cash. Um, you know, it's, it's not going to hurt them in terms of trying to get into the playoffs or anything like that. But they, they are a good, Eastern Washington is a good team with a rough schedule, but, I don't think they're the best in recent memory because it's honestly, I, in my opinion, it's last year's Weber State team, the team that was, you know, that was one in I think one in three and, and one in four and still being ranked in the top twenty-five because of the promise that they that they had. Yeah, it'll be very interesting how Eastern plays. Kyler has said before he didn't think this year would be great for Eastern. He thinks twenty twenty-three is a good season for him. Uh, what is your favorite tailgate food, Steve Kurtenbach, who really loaded us with questions, which is awesome. Thank you so much, Steve. 
Favorite tailgate food? Um, I'm a pretty basic guy. Ketchup, mustard, throw it on the hot dog. I love wings when I'm like in a more formal setting, but I wipe my hands like a psychopath with napkins, so I don't want wings at the tailgate. Don't have enough ammo there. Standard hot dog, man. Keep it American. Uh, Rev, what are you eating there for tailgate food, dude? Man, I mean, does beer count? Um, but besides that, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's great. All the cookout food, hot dogs, hamburgers. Um, I do like it whenever um, I have been able to be lucky enough to be in Frisco and my buddy Tony has been out there cooking at the tailgate because he does put out some really, really darn good food. Uh, but no, just if, if it's just me running our tailgate, it's going to be simple. Hot dogs, hamburgers, keep it simple. Enjoy the day. I know some folks go out, go all out and do like, you know, pulled pork, pork or briskets and stuff at tailgates. And, you know, that's, that's great. But for me personally, just keep it simple. There you go. Jamie, you go a little more uh, high end there. You stick it simple like us. You know me. I'm, I'm not, I'm not high end. <laughs> Rotten a Bud Light. So this is, <laughs> so if you guys are in Frisco with us next year and you're like, Hey, come to my rig, come whatever. And you feel like you, can't host us because you don't have anything fancy that's so far beyond the truth it sounds like you can just toss us a few hot dogs and we'll be just fine with it so all right um jamie williams here's your last question steve Kurtenbach again another question appreciate you steve uh here you go i'm gonna put on a little um little background acoustic simina music here you go your james madison dukes victory over app state uh your reactions man go ahead uh my reaction really is this is why we made the move this exact week is why we made the move why would i be excited about playing bucknell and beating them 59 to (laughs) three i'm gonna give i'll give them three because i'll get a field goal to go to play in the sun belt to play a former a now new current rival at their building to be down like we were the Atlanta Falcons in the Super Bowl and come storming back. I I couldn't have asked for a better start to the Sun Belt and to have votes in the top 25 poll and the coaches poll. That was my goal for next year is to get votes. And it really bodes well. I'm really, really excited to be at the conference home opener this weekend, weather permitting. Um, mm. It's just that was a big win. That was a statement win for that program. And it already ranks up there with the NDSU win, with the Virginia Tech win. It is that big and that important. And that's why we made the move, and it was awesome. It was awesome. Congrats to your Dukes. I'm rocking my James Madison Dukes hat, uh, which you Duke fans so awesomely purchased for me. So congratulations to your team. It's really cool to see those former FCS teams really have a lot of success over former FCS teams. So very cool, my man. Congratulations to the Duke and all of our former James Madison fans and a lot of them who still listen to our podcast and support us to this day. Uh, that being said, guys, speaking of great games and exciting moments, we probably have one coming up this weekend in our Game of the Week. This is the matchup you should be paying attention to. This is the FCS Fans Nation Game of the Week. All right, gentlemen, Game of the Week. Going to be a great one in the CAA. We already kind of mentioned Elon before. They will be hosting number 17, three and one Richmond. Uh, so number 17, Richmond is going to go to three and one, number 23, Elon, a top 25 matchup as of today's stats, top 25 votes, which just dropped. Here you go, Jamie. Floor is yours. Former CAA, uh, two great teams matching up against each other. You've been high on the Richmond Spiders. Who do you think wins this and what's the score? Well, you know what we always say. It's ten oh five and Richmond sucks. Yeah, it was... <laughs> don't put it on a tee because I'm gonna I'm gonna whack it right down the fairway. Yeah, but are they gonna suck? I don't know, man. But there we go. Not so fast, my friend. Richmond will not <laughs> suck. I mean, they'll always suck, but on the football field this weekend, they will not suck against Elon, and Richmond will come away with a thirty to twenty victory on the road, and uh, just pad that resume just a little bit more. 10 point victory. I'm with you, Jamie. I'm going to take Richmond actually by more. I'm going to take Richmond to win Richmond to win 37 14. I think they're going to dominate Elon. I think they're going to play strong ball. Really like what they got going on right now. And I loved your preseason evaluation of them. Rev, what do you think? We're going with the spiders. You think the Phoenix have a chance here or are we going clean sweep? I'm going to go with 
the Phoenix. And the last time I went with the Phoenix on a gut bet, it won me a lot of money, like I was talking about before the show. You know, coming, you know, if we look at their their games this year, I mean, yes, they they hung him with Vanderbilt, but they, you know, they're coming off with some momentum here, beating, you know, beating Bill and Mary. You know, they shut out Wofford earlier. Um, the Jeremy Wofford's bad, but Wofford also hung him, you know, with Kennesaw State some. With it being at home, weather permitting, obviously, um, I'm going to give it to the Phoenix. Um, I 28-24. Going with a little bit of a upset there. It should be a fun battle, uh, unless my prediction comes true. And uh, it'll be cool to see who gets off on a really good foot for the CAA play, which is going to be very deep and intense to see who wins it. We don't have that James Madison team just rolling the conference anymore, so it should be fun to see. Well, we'll see what happens with those predictions, and we'll see what happens in week five. That does bring an end to the FCS Fan Station podcast for the week. Shameless plug, and then Revs get in the final moment. Uh, please make sure you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube for sure, uh, for the FCS Fans Nation podcast to get this every week, guys. We answer your questions. It's guided by your questions. On YouTube specifically, it's the FCS Fans Nation Network, which has over eight FCS podcasts. It's your one-stop place for podcasts, videos. We do shorts, lots of announcements on there. There'll be a lot of live streams. Um, all the way from Fight on Montana to the Wax Sun podcast to Jack Rabbit Illustrated. It's all right there for you. So great quality content. And with that, thank you so much to Dustin Held the Rev, a great friend of ours who we will see in Frisco again this year, for joining us this evening. And Rev, the final moments are yours, man. And no matter what you say, you better have a great line. You better end it with a boom. Okay? So it's on you. The floor is yours, Rev. Well, I had 98 points I was going to bring up to in this, but uh, I don't think we're going to do that. Let's just look. There's some great rivalry games this week. There's some great matches. Let's We're getting into October. This is the best part of the season, in my opinion. Let's be excited. We got some good football. Let's get you know get hyped and get pumped. Frisco's getting closer, and that's going to be a fun weekend. We hope to see you there. Um, I will try to keep my shirt on this year. So, um, you know, just, just, you know, but no, thanks for having me on. Uh, and you know, let's have a great weekend of football. Boom. Thank you for listening to the FCS fans nation podcast. Make sure to like, and subscribe to this podcast on your preferred listening platform, whether it's Apple, Spotify, Google, or even YouTube. And make sure to follow our FCS fans nation, social media pages, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you for listening to the premier podcast for FCS football. Boom. I'd wear SDSU gear. I told those boys that. They don't send me anything. You already oh, done Brent, it. Brendan will load you up. UN, UND I won't wear. UND is the only one I won't wear. I don't care about wearing rabbit gear. Let's see. I-